Hello, bienvenida, or bentornato to my channel. Today I have in store a different kind of sketchbook tour that I hope you'll like. Tell me if this feels familiar to you. You try to set aside time every day to draw, whether it be for two hours, one hour, or just 15 minutes. You manage to do it the first few days, but pretty soon you miss a day, maybe because of a small emergency or you just passed out after a long day at work. You tell yourself it's no big deal because you'll get back on the next day, but the next day arrives and something else comes up, so you have to skip again. Suddenly, it's been a few days and you fear that starting again will put you back at zero. Or you do start and you don't have that steam you did in the beginning, and you're sitting there not knowing where to start or what to do. And now, you're not drawing at all. One day, you have an idea for a big piece you want to create, but you don't because you don't feel like you have the skill to pull it off. And it's all because you couldn't spend a few minutes every day practicing for that one day when you would be able to do something more than just practice. That feeling is one that I would venture to guess we've all experienced. For me, it hit me hard after I graduated, when I had to jump straight into working two jobs because my student loans were tearing down my doors. My artwork, the very purpose of my education, was being neglected, and trying to draw for the sake of practicing was impossible after a long day at work. I would get home, barely able to pay rent as it was, and just want to crash. I would try to sit and draw either at lunch or at home, but I just couldn't. Nothing came to mind to draw, and the idea of just drawing something for the sake of it pained me. I wanted to create, not replicate. My mind had been turned off all day just to get through work and the monotony of it all. I wanted to turn my brain on when it came to my art, but trying to make that happen like flipping a switch just isn't something I can do. I looked into all of the usual forms of help, theme lists, random pose reference sites, books, and even other art YouTubers but it would always turn out the same. I would try and inevitably fail to start and maintain a habit. I had the best intentions, but life's hurdles were wreaking havoc on my execution. Not only that, but oftentimes those solutions I found depend on your ability to feel an immediate effect from small stimuli. While a lot of people can do that, my mind just never worked that way. Give me a stimulus and I can't help but think and think and think about it. Honestly, in sometimes agonizing detail. I just can't read a word or see a color palette and hit the ground running with an idea. For me, drawing is like this deep, explorative process that takes me on a journey of research and introspection. It's a deliberate method of analysis, building, and reanalyzing until I arrive at the final product. It's something that owns a portion of my brain at all hours of the day. For those of you who read The Prince by Machiavelli, most likely in high school, you may recognize this quote. I hold it to be true that fortune is the arbiter of one half of our actions, but that she still leaves us to direct the other half or perhaps a little less. And in that, I believe, is the difference between the fantasy and reality of being a practicing artist. The fantasy is that after all of the things I have to do during the day, I can fully be involved in my artwork the moment it becomes time to, that I'll be able to flip it on like a switch, and I'll be off practicing and improving every day, getting in my 10,000 hours towards mastery. But the reality is by the time I've gotten to that little scrap of a drawing hour, the majority of my day has exhausted me. And in that bit of free time, I don't have the mental bandwidth to figure out something to draw and be invested in. The time may have been set aside successfully, but it's not time I'm in control of. Art isn't some object bound by use. 
It isn't an instrument that waits to be played. Art is this omnipresent spirit that affects everything you see and do. It thrusts you into daydreams any time it deigns to. Its will is separate from your own, and when we create our best, it isn't because we forced it, but because we worked together to reach great ends. So why is it we cram our art, our passion, into an hour-long box at the end of the day? Maybe it's because we've been told to. Maybe it's because we're told a day job and everything else comes first. But the idea of don't quit your day job, pursue your passions in your free time is in direct opposition to how passions work, especially creative ones. So today I'd like to show you how I've pursued my passion in spite of a day job for years at all hours of my day by taking you through my sketchbook. I was that kid who was drawing since long before I can remember. I took to painting and creating things like food and water, and I knew very early on what I wanted to do with my life. As such, I read often and searched for any resource on drawing that I could from an early age. I may have forgotten to return the occasional library book and was attached to the sketches of Leonardo da Vinci. I had a very scientific way of approaching drawing that made his work so relatable, especially when it came to anatomy. I had to understand how the body was made step by step to the point I had this fantasy of painting bodies as skeletons, then muscle, then skin, with each layer visible in the final image. I was obsessed with eyes, water, fire, in both drawing them and understanding how they worked. So I spent my childhood trying to figure those things out visually. I wasn't really one to make finished pieces at the time, essentially I was always practicing. I attended university for fine art, and I would spend up to 12 hours a day, three to four days a week in studio classes, with the rest of my time spent either at home working on my assignments and side projects, or at museums taking notes on the works there. That time really bolstered my skill, especially since the start of uni was also the start of oil painting for me. By the time I graduated, I'd spent the better part of two decades exclusively practicing art, and I wanted to take the leap into creating finished artworks. But life hit me pretty hard right out of the gate, and my artwork suffered because of it. I used to work in a pretty big book, something like an 8.5 by 11, but wow, did that become cumbersome and intimidating after a long stretch of not drawing. Even if I know I'm likely not going to be drawing, I prefer to keep my sketchbook on me at all times, just in case. And, well, I'm not a big purse or backpack kind of person. So I eventually made the switch to this petite lady, with the idea that it would be easier to lug and easier to fill. That wound up partially true. I tried for a long time to work by day and draw by night. It took me some time to get established after uni, so by the time I finally had a space to draw in at night, I felt like I was either so out of practice that nothing would come out right, or I couldn't think of anything to draw because I hadn't in such a long time. So I would sit there trying to draw and fail, or I would try to think of something and fail. In reality, neither one of those issues were true. I knew that I'd put the time into practicing, and I knew that I could form an idea when I was in the right headspace. If I just think about the amount of studio classes I had during university, that alone totaled 5,000 hours of work, of practice. And that isn't taking into account the hours every week I'd spent in the studio, outside of classes, or the times I painted at home, or all of the time I spent learning from the moment I decided I wanted to become an artist. I have been practicing all my life, and I imagine many of you have as well. And whether they were assignments or personal projects, I had produced finished pieces when I was in school. The problem was that after graduating, after struggling to work multiple jobs and keep my artwork alive and failing, I reached a point where I couldn't stand the thought of practicing anymore. I still wanted to improve, of course, but I couldn't stand to push myself to use my only time for practicing when I wanted to be creating, and I couldn't create if I kept up this guilt over not first practicing. 
That is when I started handling my sketchbook in a different way. I stopped looking for things to practice, and I started looking for inspiration. It wasn't that I decided I had learned it all, it's that I decided I had learned enough to now focus on honing my creativity and becoming the artist I wanted to be. There were paintings I wanted to make, and I decided that I would make them and get good at what they needed as I made them. I could deliberately learn those things in order to make something, instead of practicing a skill just to have it under my belt. I started taking notes any time an idea dawned on me, whether I was at work, with family, or at home. Every new idea got a page of its own, even though that meant I was leaving big, blank pages in my sketchbook. If I found a word, an item, or a song that I found interesting, it would get a corner on a new page or an entire spread. And at any point in my day, I would write what it inspired little by little. I would leave my book open so I could flip from page to page and add notes, sketch a thumbnail or element as ideas came to me. I would draw figures as shapes just to flesh out their placement and have an idea of their poses. And quickly, my sketchbook became a place of planning instead of practicing. And that meant that at the end of the day or week when I would finally get that stretch of time, I would sit down and know, just by checking my notes, what I had to draw, what I had to practice, and that at any given moment I had a collection of ideas to hop between as it suited me. That was when drawing became far more fluid for me. I could take a few notes or scribble a thumbnail and know exactly what pose I needed for a piece or develop an entire composition within a matter of minutes because my note taking was making my process unrestrained by a day job. And with that fluidity, I found new interests, new things about art that now had the time to fascinate me. Symbols emerged from the depths of my mind, demanded representation in my artwork, and my mind pined for more and more information. When I had the money, I bought books to satisfy my newfound interests. And when I couldn't draw for whatever reason, I'd open one of those books and just flip around learning things that expanded my own creativity. There was a joy in my sketchbook now that there hadn't been before when all I could think of was work, sleep, and what I should be drawing. I could actually enjoy learning again because I was learning with a deliberate purpose in mind. My sketchbook's pages now range from a corner of notes or a thumbnail all the way to a full-blown spread that's been covered edge to edge. So you'll get to see what my process has become since I made this major change to my approach. I'll be showing you five pages from my sketchbook, each being ideas at different points of progress. The first will be simple, just a thumbnail. The second will be a thumbnail with a good bit of notes. The third, fourth, and fifth will all be large sketches, but each one will be tackling their ideas in different ways, ending with a fully filled spread. And by the end of this video, my hope is that you'll have a better idea of what I do to plan a drawing, especially if you find it helps you in developing a process of your own. Like I said earlier, the way I get started is usually notes, then thumb, then the rest. But sometimes I do just go straight to the thumbnail and work from there. You'll get to see it all as we go. We'll start here. This page is one we'll call Veils. I don't really tend to name my work, but since I have to call each something to keep track of their files on my computer, I've started giving them one word titles based on their most obvious elements. The way I work now, an idea tends to start as either a few notes or a thumbnail. In this case, it was a thumbnail. Generally, when I start any drawing, I start with the main subject, specifically their head. Then I drew this one to the right. These two were my subjects, with everything else being environmental. I redrew the reclining figure a few times before drawing the second, then again after the second to make sure the two worked with one another. The surrounding figures, or veils as I call them, are actually a recurring theme in my writing and artwork, although this is the only time you'll see them today. Here I decided to use them in place of furniture for a few reasons, one of which being that I wanted to envelop the main figure in a kind of shape of her own making. 
Here you can see that the veils are surrounding her, creating something like an embrace or an aura around her as she works, with this one here holding up her book. I believe I came at this with a few lines to block out how I wanted the veils to surround her, and then went in with placing their heads and forms to fill out that space. Since this plan was a totally visual one, all of my note taking was done within this small bundle of shapes and lines. And what is most important here is the fact that while parts of this thumbnail are well defined, plenty is not. For instance, you can see that I drew a line at the top here, laying down a border for my image, but I didn't do that to the other three sides. I left them open to be expanded on if and when I come back to this page because, for my idea at the time, it wasn't necessary to define. Similarly, these circles around the figure's feet have no definition beyond being circles, nor notes. When I was drawing this cluster of figures, I knew there had to be an element that adorned the space, but I wasn't sure what. Again, it wasn't the focus of the idea at the time. But that doesn't mean that they aren't important to the idea as a whole. Depending on what I end up making them, these circles could end up being pivotal to how the piece is read in its entirety. To really illustrate what I mean, look at allegorical paintings, i.e. anything with a name beginning with allegory of such and such. At its core, this drawing is my version of an allegory painting. In Self-Portrait as the Allegory of Painting by Artemisia Gentileschi, you notice little elements the more you look at the painting that communicate to you what the point is. The paintbrushes and palette are dead giveaways that this is an artist we're looking at, and her raised arm and angled body tell us she's at work. The gray slab under her arm and the necklace hanging from her chest are not as obvious, but they make you wonder the more you look at them. Why does that slab have letters carved into it? Because those are Artemisia's initials, so now we know the artist depicted is meant to be Artemisia herself. Why is she wearing such a long necklace, and why is there a face at the end of it? She's wearing it because a gold chain with a mask of imitation is symbolic for the artist. Using these elements, Artemisia created an image that could speak for itself through a visual language. That is what I want to do with this idea. But being that this thumbnail was just the beginning of an idea, I didn't hold myself to making hard and fast decisions about each and every element that made up the image. I gave myself something more definite in my subjects, something that I can look at and immediately know what I'll need to practice or sketch large scale when I have the time, and placeholders in these circles to think about throughout my day. In just one small thumbnail, I have deliberate practice waiting for me and an open space for my imagination to engage with. Working with both of these extremes can really help you to re-engage with an idea easily, even if it's been a while since you last touched it. If I can give you one bit of advice based on this sketch, it would be to let your ideas be amorphous, at least partially, the further they get from the subject. Capture the shape of your idea and let it develop throughout the process, rather than fully at the beginning. Moving on, this is a piece I'll call Headache for the song it was inspired by. Here we have a list of notes, ending with a thumbnail, where you'll see I've again started with a defined subject and spread out the elements around her with much less definition. Fair warning, this piece has dark imagery that may bother you depending on how you feel about light gore, body horror, and insects. I won't be going over the idea of this piece in detail, but I'm sure something like this could be disturbing to some. If you don't want to hear any more on this one, feel free to mute me or skip to the following timecode to go to the next spread. If you're wondering, the song that inspired this idea is Headache by Motionless and White, and these are the specific lyrics I focused on. This page is an example of a song getting stuck in my head and being played on repeat so I can capture the flickers of images that it creates in my head. Mind you, working like this is never about translating the song into a visual medium. It's about pulling out what the song stirs in me and putting that to paper. 
Sometimes a song might have very visual lyrics like this one does, and those might become elements in my drawing, but the intention is never to make an interpretation of the song. Take these two lines. Literally, they paint an image of a subject with some feeling beneath her skin and maybe flies pouring from her eyes to you as the viewer being spoken to. In my head, this idea bloomed from the thought of somehow bad skin and insects and became the men are glossy or waxy like candles. Their mouths are full of flies that are bursting out of their eyes. From there, the idea develops all of these other bits, like the subject being a woman, at her feet she's surrounded by shriveled male figures who've done something to her, and we're viewing her from behind with our point of view in line with her own as she looks down on these men she's taken revenge on in some way. And then there's a drain on the floor behind her heels with a blood flow forms a smile, Harkening back to the line, sanity circles the drain with a smile. There are also songs that have inspired me that contain no visuality to their lyrics, but the concept and the instruments just come together to make something so material in my head. That's the magic of metal for me. But song and notes aside, let's look at the thumbnail. Here is the central figure, pretty fleshed out compared to the last spread. I had the idea of her pose pretty early on and started the thumbnail from there, probably before I'd written these last few notes, as I didn't immediately know where these edges would fall. These last few notes are about the little things like the figure being about six heads tall, there maybe being a dead fly on her shoulder that she picks off, or about her skin tone. On the larger spread, you can see me feeling out those first two things. To figure out the height, I looked up the average height of a person in heads, approximately seven to seven and a half, and drew a circle for a head, a curve for the spine, and felt out how many heads I felt would be appropriate for this angle. Fewer heads would mean seeing more floor than background, and more upper body than legs. I decided I wouldn't make it too dramatic since I wanted her legs very visible and arrived at six and a half heads. And then here, I considered using bees instead of flies, and so sketched bees in a few poses simply to see whether they gave me the right shape and tone for what I wanted. The poses I liked, the bees I did not. One day, I might prime these pages and use the space to try painting a few skin tones to get the right one. For now, I just noted dark skin, same for the other figures, glossy waxy skin. The most important information about them at this stage was their position, which is why they're just a bunch of floating heads here. Again, details can be left open to interpretation as you work. I look at this spread and imagine all the ways I could arrange the insects, the different positions these figures could be in, and how exactly I could make the drain work behind the subject. Those are all things that I haven't drawn yet because they don't need to be decided now. Generally, the more square footage you give an idea, the more the idea gives back to you. So leaving those details open to manipulation furthers my creative process. I might take a sudden interest in a completely different bug somewhere down the line and have to shift these figures to fit that. By doing things in this way, I can change my mind without hurting the work I've already done. Again, keep your ideas open. When you thumbnail like this, only draw what you need to communicate the core idea and let your notes do the rest. Now, this is actually the first entry in this sketchbook. I know this is totally out of order, but it's purposeful. We'll call this one Wings. The sketch is where I revamped the way I work, and as you can see, Wings is our first full spread. This one might be the largest thumbnail I have in this book, with my most complex arrangement of figures. While I don't remember why exactly this idea came to me, I know I'd been trying for a while to start this book off on the right foot after a long pause from drawing post-graduation and move. 
It was during this time that I'd become so exceedingly frustrated with my lack of time and space that I put a hard stop to the idea of practicing anymore and started deliberately drawing to compose future paintings. It took a while, but I finally had this idea of a figure, small, seated, and sad, on a seat of selenite. She wouldn't be aware of it, but the viewer would see wings forming from her back, those wings being made up of people who were reaching out to touch her back in solidarity and support. I started with such a small speck of a subject, at first trying to nail down correct anatomy from the get-go, and then deciding that it didn't matter that she looked perfect here, just that she communicated what I needed her to. I accepted that and slowly added these figures around her, bit by bit, circle and line by circle and line. I think it was at that point that I started this larger drawing, midway through the thumbnail. I just wanted to get down the subject. She was the center of this idea and I felt like understanding her would help me along. So I drew her and after her the rest of this idea came together. I wound up working back and forth between the sketch and the thumbnail for a while, slowly drawing these figures in poses I was not used to and adding more to the thumbnail, spreading out from the center. Drawing so many bodies in one space was very new to me, so the back and forth helped me ease into figuring it out. If I hadn't let myself do this, I probably would have fallen into the trap of drawing the same body over and over again, rather than seeking out and exploring different poses. I wound up spending a lot of my free moments on my phone, looking up reference pictures to help, from dedicated pose image packs to just googling any keywords I thought would work, floating figures, swimming figures, 360 anatomy models, etc. Basically, this was a project that took me from not drawing at all to drawing all the time. Eventually, the sky was added to the thumbnail, as well as all of these fringe figures in the clouds and distant landscape. This piece wound up having so many features to it, but when it came to the sketch, I didn't draw nearly as much as was in the thumbnail. Trying to fit all of this information into an 11 by 8.5 spread, I would barely be able to flesh out the main pose, let alone all of these bodies. When turning a thumbnail into a larger sketch, rather than try to recreate the entire thumbnail, I find it's much more helpful to focus in on a specific area, one where I'll be the most challenged by the piece, with elements that I might want to experiment with, and oftentimes one that includes the subject. Including the subject and these challenge areas allows me to not only work on both, but also to work on how they relate to each other. Another thing you'll notice here is that I didn't center the subject on my spread, but instead pushed her off to one page. Had I centered her here, I wouldn't have been able to try these full body poses that would be important to making this wing idea work. Sure, I would have been able to figure out more poses on the right side, but they would be partial bodies without enough room on either side to try as much twisting and movement. I find when sketching from a thumbnail for the first time, the primary purpose is to make sure your subject and most vital supporting elements are being figured out, like building a support beam before you bring in the interior design. You can think of it like this. Your thumbnail is about the core idea. You use it to get your initial plan down and it often works best when done simply, with smaller elements left open for later interpretation. Your notes are the details you want to keep in mind, but wouldn't necessarily include in your thumbnail. Sometimes they're a way of talking yourself through your ideas, and they are always open to change. Your sketch is the main structure, where you figure out the most important parts of your image that everything else is dependent upon. And your painting is where you put it all together and add in all of the little things as they feel right. Looking back, I think this is the best opening page I've ever made for any of my sketchbooks, and it really set a precedent for the rest of the book. It's the most dynamic for sure, and honestly, it serves as a good reminder to be free with my work when I'm getting too stiff. The fact that I never set a border to this thumbnail and left some of these bodies unfinished reminds me that I'm free to expand on and change my ideas as I need to.
onto a spread that might look familiar to you if you've seen my earlier videos. This one I call Throne. After some time of messing with wings and trying to create more spreads, I decided to try gathering pose references to give myself a collection I could pull from when I wanted to. The intention was to have pre-selected poses to pull for practice, but in practice, I wound up with poses I was inspired to create full-scale compositions around. This pose was the first that I was really taken with. It was the position of the shoulders and arms that had me captivated. The strength in them communicated something so powerful and feminine that I wanted to make something from it, as if there was a painting in the pose that I needed to pull out. Obviously, this idea came to me in a very different way than the previous three we've discussed so far. Rather than starting with a note or a thumbnail, it started with a reference image with a thumbnail made later. But I think of it more as having been inspired by the subject before the composition or the narrative. In this sketch's case, I drew the body first and the rest developed as I listened to a certain song on repeat and revisited the page. At first, I was just riding on the power of the pose, sketching it in portrait because I knew I wanted a tall composition. The more I listened to the song, the more I visualized the elements of the piece, and the more I thought about the meaning of it. I thought about what it would mean to portray a powerful woman, especially one who has taken power in her life, the ugly parts of that rise, the stories she could tell, and the duality of her story. Balance is an integral part of my thought process, and I wanted her to be representative of balance. I think the physical representation of balance in her arms is what drew me to this pose. I actually own a sculpture of the goddess Themis, not because of anything government or justice system related, but because of the symbolic nature of her form. She is blindfolded and calm of face, holding up a scale in her right hand and a sword in the left. In some versions, she holds her scale off to her side often daintily and by the tips of her fingers, and foists her sword into the air. But in my version, her scale is held high and forward, fully in front of her and in a strong fist. Her sword is also held firmly, but it hangs at rest at her side with its tip in the dirt. And her stance is that of a contraposto, with her weight firmly planted in her left foot, supporting the right hand that holds up her scale. Her right foot is more lightly placed, like her sword, atop a snake and a book. I look at that sculpture and I see the dichotomy of justice. That is the kind of power a pose can have. That said, for this piece, I got to work thinking about the significance of her pose, of each hand, what it would mean for each to hold certain things, and how I could communicate a message through different kinds of props. During this time, I was very into Nordic art and history, so think runes, carved horns, and straight swords for an idea of where my mind was. You can see in the sketch, I settled on a sword held in her right hand and a drinking horn suspended from her left. While her right hand would be a closed fist, the other would be an open palm. Here, you'll see I wrote, right, hard, on the sword, Nordic runes, carvings for family, love, protection, humility. And here I wrote, left, soft, on the horn, relief carvings of war, loss, sacrifice, hope. For the sake of this spread, the most important things to figure out were, one, how she would hold each, and two, how each would be shaped. The horn I would figure out later. I had an idea of a ribbed horn, like a ram's or a gazelle's, that was about as long as the sword, but more naturally curved. That was enough information at this stage. I could always come back to flesh out more details further down the road. The sword I figured out on a separate page here, and you'll see I tried out a few ideas. This page is a good example of learning as you go, or as something takes your interest, rather than learning all of the things beforehand. I was focused on understanding the different kinds of swords that were out there, the cultures they came from, and how their owners would have decorated them. At this point, I hadn't settled on Nordic props. I didn't even really know how long I wanted the blade to be. 
So I sketched out a few different styles of sword. Measuring out the page and portioning out how much space I could dedicate to an idea helped me so that I could see all of my ideas in one place. And it made me feel like I was being as efficient with my space as possible. It also meant that I couldn't spend too much time on a single idea, which helped me to portion out my focus for each try. The first one I drew was at the top here. Since swords weren't a regular prop at the time, I started with looking up the first sword that came to mind, Andril from The Lord of the Rings. I used it as a reference to get a feel for drawing hilts, especially the pommel and the guard. It was a simple exercise that gave me a good jumping off point. The next one's hilt was based off of my favorite fictional sword, the Rakuyo of Lady Maria from Bloodborne. This little gap here extended the hilt in a way that I thought I might like to explore. And thereafter, I messed with a wider blade to hilt ratio, using a symbol as the pommel, and then took a complete left turn with something that looked more like a kitchen knife on Fantasy Forest and Crack. Afterwards, I took some time away from this idea as a whole. I kept reading about swords and finding different reference images to better familiarize myself with them, and though I wasn't drawing, I was learning. I was comparing sword lengths to our height, and I was looking at examples of those drinking horns I'd mentioned earlier. I found out their average size and look, and while I wanted mine to be longer than usual for the purpose of my painting, I didn't want it either too ridiculously long or overshadowed by the length of the sword. I also figured that the hilt of my, as of yet, indeterminate sword should relate to the horn. That got me thinking about the material of horns, bone. Maybe the grip and pommel can be a bone. It could be a femur, the longest and strongest bone in the body. Better yet, why not think about a sword as seen by a swordsman, the way I, as an artist, see my sketchbook, as an extension of myself, an extension of my own arm, a humerus. And then the hilt could be bone too. What kind of bone looks like a hilt? Especially one like on this earlier try. Actually, what is my favorite part of the body? The spine. This trail of thoughts led me to the perfect concept, a sword as much a part of my subject as this painting is of me. And like that, I figured out a crucial element of my composition, not by knowing everything beforehand, but by joyously diving deeply into the research of it when it inspired me. And bouncing between swords, drinking horns, and my original drawing helped me to figure out more about each of these concepts as I went. Finally, we come to the last spread I'd like to share with you today. It is by far the most detailed one I've ever drawn in any of my sketchbooks, and it's one I am simultaneously so excited and intimidated to turn into a fully realized painting. Probably more than any other. This one we'll call Womb. It also started from a reference picture and exploded out from there. This figure, the woman, was what came from the original picture. Here you'll see that this one actually did start with a thumbnail, unlike Throne. This spread did also have notes galore, but they were used less as solid idea bullets and more so as conversations with myself as I worked. But basically, as I filled up the area with more and more sketch, those notes ended up erased and covered. Notes are great for a variety of reasons, but depending on the piece, they can be best used transiently. This thumbnail on the right is of the original idea for the central figures, suspended in darkness, a hole in the upper left corner where the light would pour in from. But you can see that it stops short after the figure's feet and cuts off the hole. This empty thumbnail was where I played with the dimensions this idea should get as a painting. Clearly longer and narrower than my book and at such a dramatic ratio that if I were to try to fit it all in here, say using the left half here for the composition and the right for notes, I would have been drawing dots or shading to suggest the elements I wanted to explore. I think that kind of pencil work is better kept in small thumbnails. This idea was about details, and I needed to flesh out some of those details to know whether the rest was worth continuing with. 
Like the previous spreads, I placed the central figures and branched out from there. As I draw, you'll see multiple examples of note-taking along the way. Here, I'm debating on how to pose the figure's arm. At first, I started to draw it going to the right over his body, but I quickly realized how unnatural that would look given how I drew his shoulder. I noted that I should try foreshortening here and gave a quick scribble of how that might look. Then I moved on to his legs and did much of the same. I note something that I want so that I have a point to go back to and reference when I start to feel like I'm going off the rails with trying things or when I've had to take a long pause from the drawing. And sometimes it can be really helpful to redraw what you have in miniature form to figure out what is or isn't working. It's a quicker way of problem solving than you would have if you kept redrawing it here. That isn't to say that I settle on what I want before I draw it on the main sketch, but it does mean that I spend less time drawing dramatically different options on such a big space. Drawing small first means that what I draw large will likely only need slight adjustments. As you see here, every time I redraw the leg, I'm moving the knee incrementally out. I'm not going from one pose to a dramatically different one because I was able to feel out a good, narrow range of what I wanted in that smaller scribble. From here, I jump and experiment around the figures, continuing to note, erase, and note some more as I go. They remind me of ideas I have, any skills to keep in mind, and when I'm done with them, I erase them. For this piece, I really wanted to push myself and fill the spread. And since I love bodies, I wanted to channel figure work, like in Peter Paul Rubin's The Fall of the Damned. And going back to the idea of planning, introducing an element like that into this piece wouldn't mean making a concrete finished drawing that I would transfer onto a final panel. It would mean getting an idea of what that element would look like next to my subjects. The main factors I had to keep in mind were direction, space, and variation. If you look at Rubin's painting, all of the figures have a life of their own. They all move in their own way according to what their specific story is. No one here feels like a lifeless NPC just standing around to support the main character's story. And that is something I want to capture in all of my work. So what I did was I laid out a few lines to guide their direction drew a frontmost figure with its back to the viewer to keep in mind the space and its volume, and drew out as many figures as I could using simple tools I already had, i.e. a circle for the head, an oval for the rib cage, and then lines to connect them once I'd placed enough. No faces, because that would be detail unnecessary for this phase. As I got smaller with my figures, I switched to drawing more subtractively to pre-shade them and speed up the process. Eventually, this is what the spread became. Is it a finished idea? No. But is it a finished spread? Yes. This, like my previous two spreads, is a finished plan of an idea, with all of the elements I needed to understand there on the page. To circle back to the start of this video, the point of this sketchbook isn't to practice, 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 nor is it to have a portfolio of masterclass finished works prettily bound in a hardcover book. The point of this sketchbook is to plan ideas, to purposefully tackle the elements I need for a piece as they come to me. That said, your sketchbook truly is just the start of it all. There is so much that goes into creating a final piece and finding a way to have both the time and inspiration to get an idea there is a balance that we as artists need to find within each of ourselves. Remind yourself that your art is fundamentally part of you. And just like you, it lives and breathes at all hours of the day. Let it come out whenever it needs to and you'll find it ready to meet you when you call upon it.